Right, good afternoon. Um, while I was preparing for this talk, I uh, went across to the symposium website and uh, read on there that um, the large-scale professional surveys have robbed amateurs of some of the niche areas that they used to contribute to in science. Exoplanets, however, was uh, the complete opposite. Um, they were never in the amateur realm at all. But uh, today, I'm here to tell you that there are amateurs all around the world are actually observing these exoplanets mainly by the transit method, uh, mainly due to the relatively cheap equipment that's available in telescopes, CCDs, DSLRs, etc. Uh, but I need to go slightly back to uh, 2014. Um, I was busy doing my honours at uh, UNISA, the University of South Africa, under Professor Dirk Smits. And uh, as part of our honours, we were required to um, to do a uh, literature review in any, any current topic in astronomy. And exoplanets being one of my uh, um, interest areas, I decided uh, this would be a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, and, and as I started to, um, to uh, look into the exoplanet uh, area, I came across articles like this in popular magazines where uh, amateurs were actually detecting uh, exoplanets, which I didn't think had been possible. Then if, uh, there are some more articles, and if you look a little bit closer, some of these uh, were using four-inch telescopes. And I was quite stunned by this, because I didn't think this would be possible. Uh, and then on, on top of it all, as it turns out, you don't even need a telescope. Um, the, this guy by the name of David Schneider uses a barn door tracker. I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with it, and a standard DSLR. Um, there's his website explains how he does it. He's also got a YouTube video up to explain uh, how, how this is done. Um, and then uh, if you go across to the AABSO website, I'd found that they've been uh, um, doing this already since uh, 2010 uh, on how to, uh, there were some articles on how to observe exoplanets with uh, DSLRs. It was still in its infancy at this stage and there was a lot of discussion about how this, uh, how this was uh, done. Um, and then I went across to the professional um, um, uh, exoplanet surveys. Here you see SuperWASP, which is uh, based in uh, Sutherland. Uh, as you can see, it's just made up an array of uh, small aperture cameras. The reason is just to increase the field of view uh, to cover as much sky as possible. Uh, this hat net is a uh, Hungarian automated telescope. They've got seven telescopes around the world also doing the uh, same thing. And this is the Qatar Exoplanet Survey. Not as successful, uh, based at the University of Qatar, but basically the principle is the same for all of these. Um, so it was at this point uh, that I decided to approach uh, Professor Smith as the possibility of actually using the UNISA Observatory to detect these exoplanets. And I think when he got off the floor laughing, uh, he actually saw that I was serious and he handed off the, the, um, the observatory keys to me and he said I must go ahead, but I must just keep in mind that I, I still need to do the, uh, the um, literature review uh, just in case this didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, okay, this, let's just go back to, uh, go to the UNISA observatory. This was opened in 1992 and being a better part of 25 years old is starting to show its age now. Uh, the telescope is a Celestron C14 CompuStar um, uh, and attached to it was just uh, was the standard uh, SPIC camera, I think it was a ST9 camera and I had the flip mirror system in there which I'll explain to you in a second. Um, I, don't, I, wouldn't like, I don't normally do this but I'd like to just explain some of the issues that I had because it might encourage some of the amateurs out there to say uh, you know, we professional astronomers, oh, sorry, let me just go back, uh, professional astronomers have got everything perfect and whatnot. This is considered a professional observatory, but there's actually a lot of problems with it. Uh, so uh, as uh, problems are bread and butter of uh, amateur. Um, first, I, I don't actually have a photo of it, but just in the corner there, you can see there's some Velcro straps. That uh, holds a two litre Coke bottle filled with water. Um, this uh, telescope has got a problem with the right ascension worm gear uh, and there's so much play in it that they use the 2 litre coke bottle to keep the pressure on the worm gear so that the telescope doesn't flop around. Um, and that's... Uh, okay, uh, let's, let's move on to the next slide. 
Um, this leads to problems like this with the wind gear that uh, the telescope periodically sort of slips anything between 5 to 10 arc minutes, which meant that I had to limit my uh, exposures to 30 seconds only. Uh, and that's the reason for, also for the reason I had the flip mirror, is uh, trying to align the telescope uh, is actually quite difficult when it's flopping around. And to add uh, to the problem is, uh, this is the only device I've ever come across in 20 years of working in IT that had a Y2K problem. So it doesn't actually know that it's in the, t in the 21st century, which means that during alignment, uh, uh, the sidereal time was completely out, so you had to fool the telescope into, into uh, saying that this is where a star is when you actually could see nothing, and then only after uh, the telescope is up and running, then you had to actually point it at the correct stars and resync it. Uh, but even then, it was never perfect because uh, you had to sort of slew around all over the sky trying to get this thing sorted. Uh, the other problem I experienced was icing of the CCD camera. That took about four months to resolve. We had to send it into professionals to try and sort that one out. Um, uh, and uh, lastly, the ob observatory lies under one of the standard instrument departure parts out of our Tango Airport. And this was more common. This, I think, was SA226 to Munich. <laughs> this happens more often than what I'd like. Uh, then I'd like to move over into the environment. This is uh, Pretoria, for those of you not familiar with it. This is the UNISA campus, this big building on the front here. This is a sort of typical winter's day uh, with the pollution. This isn't a bad, so it's a bit out of focus, but this is a pretty much a bad winter's day. Um, so that was one of the issues I had to deal with. Uh, the next issue I had to deal with, uh, sorry, let me just show you, this is the UNISA campus here. The observatory lies over there in the corner. This is what it looks like at night. And if you haven't spotted it yet, here is the observatory there. <laughs> It's probably the best lit observatory in the world. Um, okay, these, uh, like I said, these type of problems are probably uh, amateur astronomers' bread and butter. They're used to observing in urban areas, pollution, air pollution, light pollution, that type of thing. Um, but anyway, despite all these problems, I'd just like to just get on to how, the, how we got into how, uh, observing the exoplanets. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to the Exoplanet Transit Database, which is hosted by the Czech Astronomical Society. Um, I would have loved to do this live, but I don't think we have enough time to, to, today to do that. Um, this is a professional and uh, uh, amateur collaboration. Uh, it started initially as a, as a, um, as a uh, amateur database created by a guy by the name of Bruce Gary, which I'll get to on a bit later. Um, on the left-hand side there, there's a list of uh, known exoplanet transitors. If you go further down on this page, you can see there's a whole bunch of information on, on all these different exoplanets. Um, and if you click on any one of those links, it takes you to more information on the actual exoplanet itself. Uh, at the top uh, here, we've got the right ascension declination, uh, the visual magnitude, the transit depth, as well as the transit duration. And uh, further down on this page, you can see these are uh, um, data that's been submitted by uh, uh, the both professional as well as uh, amateur astronomers. You can see some of the qualities better than others. And more importantly, right at the bottom here is a link to the, art, the original article on the discovery of the exoplanet, which you can use then to compare the parameters that you are, you're going to obtain a bit later on. Right, um, now this is where the, the magic of this website for me happened. If you go to the top here, there's a, uh, there's a link there that says called Transit Predictions. You go in there, you insert your latitude and longitude. You see I've done that for Cape Town for tonight. I've selected the, the 9th of March there. And uh, below it, it prints out or gives you a whole list of uh, exoplanet transits that are vi uh, visible from your current location for, the, for tonight or for the date that you've selected. You can see it gives you about a 30-day window. Um, just an uh, important uh, thing to note, this is universal time, don't make a mistake like I did. <laughs> and, then, and then you realize that you're actually not seeing anything and anything else, it's just a time error. Um, these uh, transits, they show you the, uh, the start, the, mid, the midpoint, as well as the end point uh, time of the transit, as well as the uh, hour angle or altitude and azimuth, as you'd want to try and observe these things above 30 degrees, just to give yourself a fighting chance. Uh, there it gives you the transit uh, duration, 
uh, the visual magnitudes, you'll see most of them, uh, the ones that I'll show you later as well, were also in the region of about 9 to 12 magnitudes, so they're quite achievable with small telescopes. And uh, this is the uh, transit depth, is actually the depth of the light curve, which I'll show you a bit later. Uh, you'd like to try and get, uh, select a, a uh, transiting exoplanet with a maximum transit depth just for starters until you actually get familiar with the observing procedure. Um, okay. Then if you, uh, if you go back, if you click on any of these links on the left, if, once you've selected your exoplanet, it takes you to this page, which gives you a star chart, which is quite handy if you, like me, with having trouble with your with your uh, pointing on your telescope, you can use this to hop around. This is uh, generated from the digitized, uh, digitized sky survey by the Space Telescope Science Institute. If you click on that link, it takes you to this page. And if you put in the name of the uh, object or the exoplanet that you want to observe, uh, you can then, uh, down here, you can customize your uh, star chart that you wish to find it, because some of them are quite tricky to find. Uh, and you can select here, uh, you can either select a fit format or a GIF format. So this is quite handy if you just want to hop to find the right star to make sure that you've got the right uh, object that you're looking at. This is, this is for example, a 60 arc minute or one degree field of view uh, that I uh, took off that website. Then we go over to the, um, at the bottom of that previous page here, so this one here, once you've selected your exoplanet that you want to observe, it gives you the predictions for the next 365 days. Now this is quite nice here, yeah, the, the dark uh, or the bold uh, entries here, for example, show you what is actually visible, and these ones are not visible, and these ones are partially visible. But the nice part here, as you can see, there's two transits that are visible on two consecutive nights, which is quite handy when you want to, to work out the uh, orbital period. Uh, that's quite an important para parameter that you need to, uh, to work out at the beginning, otherwise you can have to obtain it from the, uh, the papers uh, uh, before you can actually work out anything else. Um, this is uh, the model fit your data. Uh, once you've actually gotten your photometry, you can actually submit your data to the Exoplanet Transit Database. Uh, they've, got, they've got all the information on how to contribute the exact format that's required and that type of thing. Um, and this is the type of information that uh, you get back once you've actually submitted your data. You'll see it gives you the two light curves. You can see these are pretty noisy. It gives you residuals at the bottom. Uh, yes, so uh, this is, uh, you can see it corrects here for the atmospheric extinction that, uh, with the tilt um, so the, uh, in the differential photometry. It compares, um, gives you some of your other, other data, and, but more importantly at the bottom here, like I see there's some errors, I didn't notice that, but it compares your, your uh, uh, data that you've, uh, that you've just observed with the actual catalog or the, the literature values. Uh, further down it's got some other, the geometry and that type of thing as well, which is quite nice to see. Um, this is the observers community for the, uh, on the Exoplanet Transit Database. Um, okay, just off the map here, there's only one uh, observer in Southern Africa, and that's in Namibia. Uh, but these are just some of the, uh, the uh, amateurs that I just selected from around the world. You can see uh, the typical type, amateur type of setups. But there are also uh, professional observatories that are actually on the system that's contributing data to it. Um, this is the, now we're going on to the actual capturing of the, of the um, uh, the, the photometry and oh, sorry, the capturing of the images. Um, here I've said uh, you must start an, an hour before the transit occurs, once you've uh, got it off the database, uh, and at least finish an hour afterwards, because what you want to do is get the out of transit uh, um, the brightness there and there, so you can actually see whether you've actually observed the transit or not. Uh, and then you take a whole time series across the, across the whole uh, transit, uh, sorry, across the um, transit duration, hour before, hour after. Importantly, we are doing differential photometry, so you need to have reference stars. Uh, this one was uh, this two mass, and that large number was uh, Qatar 2B, uh, and these are uh, the reference stars are selected. Um, normally, the literature says you must try and uh, select uh, stars of the similar spectral type, uh, but in practice, that's actually very difficult to find. So I just eyeball it, pick something that looks the same brightness, and it actually worked quite well. Um, again, uh, you need to, uh, this is probably part of the course where anyone who does um, 
uh, astrophotography or variable star observing. Uh, you need to do your sky flat, you can see a lot of dust on the collector plate there. Um, your dark frames as well as a bias frame. This is not 100% necessary, uh, but I, I, I found that actually work quite well for me. Of importance here is um, you need to know your CCD response curve. There's lots of literature on the internet, search for it on Google on how to get a response curve if you don't have it already with your cameras. Uh, so I won't go too much into that. Uh, then image reduction, again, there's lots of literature all over the place. I'm not going to go much into it. Uh, you start with the raw image, you can see a lot of light pollution and whatnot, and this is the final reduced image, that uh, one of the ones that I used. Um, then I used to, um, sorry, go back here. I had to use uh, IREF, uh, Image Reduction Analysis Facility, that was what was uh, uh, required of me for, uh, from Professor Smits. And you also require that I use this aperture photometry tool to actually do the physical photometry, which is quite nice but extremely time consuming. Um, and once you've done uh, the, all the photometry on all your stars, you get something like this. This is done in Excel. Um, here, the, this is actually Qatar to be the second one here. The rest of the three reference stars doesn't look like much uh, at the moment, but once you actually uh, there's two ways of doing this. You can actually take each individual uh, star and subtract, it, subtract that one from it to get your light curve. Or you can sum the three uh, reference stars to get one uh, brightness and then, uh, then subtract that one from it. Um, so if you've done this correctly, um, you get something that looks like that, which is uh, fairly noisy. Um, in this case, I found uh, for me it was better just to use a single reference star and then you pick the, the best light curve between, uh, between them that you, that you can find. Um, just for comparison, uh, that, this data took me, I think, about two days to, to reduce uh, and to get to the photometry and everything like that. Uh, I, I used a program also called Maxim DL. Um, which is uh, where the sort of digital edge comes in, makes our life so much easier. Here, uh, because of the, the photos weren't perfectly aligned, uh, this program, uh, you just need to just point it basically to your image folder, to your folder for your darks, for your folder for your sky flats, and the bias folder as well. Um, it automatically, uh, if you just click on the buttons, it automatically aligns everything for you. Uh, it does all the, the reduction. Um, and uh, once you've selected your, your object that you want to view as well as your reference stars and with a minute, uh, within a minute you get a, uh, a curve like that. So um, there's a lot of uh, stuff that you can still do, edit different parameters and that type of thing but just go, you can do this while you're busy observing to actually see that you are actually getting a curve or, or not and that's, this also is very useful in uh, observing variables as well. Um, okay, so going to, over to my data, uh, this is the, the four exoplanet transits that I observed, or I actually did five transits. WASP 41b, I managed to uh, observe two consecutive nights, so I was able to get the, the orbital period. And uh, you can see that data is very noisy because of the, the conditions and stuff that I encountered at UNISA. Uh, however, uh, this curve gave me an error of 0.04%. In the um, in the transit, uh, in, sorry, in the orbital period, which I thought was quite impressive, despite all the problems that we had. Um, then, uh, oh, sorry, just one other thing on here. Um, I'll show you the parameters in a second. Uh, the curve bottoms on all these on all these light curves are due to uh, solar limb darkening, which uh, affects the. Um, impact parameter as well as the orbital inclination. The impact parameter is basically the, the distance uh, or the, the perpendicular distance from the center of the star to where the exoplanet actually transits. So that, that specific distance is called the impact parameter and obviously it uh, affects the inclination. So uh, the impact parameter I um, was able to determine to within about 25% uh, which is not, not really good. But the rest of the parameters um, were within uh, in between about 10 to 15 percent, uh, which I think, considering the data, is actually quite impressive. Uh, this is just some of the, the parameters that you can get uh, from, from that specific light curve. I'll explain to you how, uh, in a second how to get this. You can obviously just submit the, the information to the Exoplanet Transit database and you could be happy with what you get. Uh, uh, 
this, these parameters are very easily uh, calculated, uh, which I'll explain in a second. Um, if, you, if you can see there, we've got, we get orbital periods, planet star area ratios, the transit duration, the impact parameter, which I just discussed, uh, stellar density, stellar mass, the stellar radius, the semi-major axis of the orbit, orbital inclination, and the planet radius, just from one light curve. Uh, this is the, these uh, parameters you can obtain from, uh, from this paper, which is freely available by Professor Sarah Seeger and uh, Dr. Gabriela Malen-Ornelas. Um, and um, I was actually having trouble originally with, with this uh, curve at the bottom, and I did uh, send off an email to Professor Sarah Seeger, which was, she was quite uh, kind enough to actually reply to me. Uh, uh, because uh, I was having trouble getting rid of this and she told me that in practice uh, the, the sort of works a little bit opposite they, they uh, fit the data actually to the, to the light curve and not the other way around uh, when it comes to the, to the, uh, uh, to the um, solar limb darkening the curve at the bottom so that's why I didn't correct for it because I didn't have the software to be able to do that um, and then lastly, uh, as we're coming to, coming to the end here, this was uh, WASP 41B, which I took from my own home uh, using a, a Mead uh, Alex 210 uh, inch telescope with a DSLR. Um, unfortunately, I have very uh, limited sky view, I've got big trees and buildings on both sides of me. Uh, but you can see the, the, the transit had just started here, and then I finished going into the trees there, so that didn't help. But you can see that the curve is quite, uh, uh, quite easily visible. Um, I think um, somebody was supposed to talk tomorrow about uh, doing the photometry with the DSLR, but unfortunately not, not, not going to be available. <coughs> uh, then uh, lastly, I'd just like to point you in the direction of this book, Bruce Gary, who was one of the, the guys who started the um, Exoplanet Transit Database while it was still in its amateur form. Uh, this is an excellent book available free of charge on his website in a PDF format. Um, in it, he goes into everything that you need to know about observing exoplanets with using a telescope, using DLSLRs, using CCD cameras, response curves, absolutely everything that you need to know. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I hope uh, I've inspired some of you to go out and try this. Um, I think some of the guys in the Pretoria area, we already been making plans to actually get together and actually show them how to do this. Um, thank you very much. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, later on, after I did this, I uh, did a BVRI uh, photometric calibration of the same telescope under the same conditions, and I managed to get uh, um, uh, to about uh, a couple of hundredths of a magnitude uh, resolution or using that same telescope. So it was based all on, on this that I had done previously. So may I ask, um, were you using the blue button filter? No, no, I was actually unfiltered, completely unfiltered, because the problem was uh, because I had the 30 second window before the, the telescope would shift uh, because of the gear, I had to actually do it completely unfiltered because otherwise, if the manager had in a filter, it would take me over the 30 seconds and I couldn't uh, take any pictures. So this was completely done in white light. So, so it just goes to show that you can actually do it. You don't need all these fancy telescopes, uh, all these fancy filters, that type of thing. You can actually do it with very, very simple equipment. This, that uh, Celestron uh, C14 is not even connected to a computer system at all in any form. It's just a little, the little normal uh, box that you put in your sidereal time and that type of thing, and that's it. You uh, said, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, I have. I, I did try it. Uh, there's lots of tools available. Uh, I, I, look, I had to work with what Professor Smith said I needed to do with, so I did try that out as well. Uh, for me, I just found, uh, you know, there's lots of different tools. I found Maxim DL did everything for me, and then I had to just deal with what Professor Smith told me I had to do. do. So, yes. Uh, both, which are with Maxim, Maxim or, or uh, Maxim DL by far. It's so much easier. Data processing. Yes, for data processing, yeah.
Uh, for me, I, I found I used that Maxim DL while I was at the telescope itself. I also did some variable star work while, for Professor Smith as well. Uh, the same thing, and it's actually very nice that you can, as you're busy saving all your fits images and whatnot, you just point that thing and just click on analyze, and it gives you the curve immediately. You can see immediately whether whether you're on a completely wrong star or whether you're actually seeing what you're supposed to see. And that was the the, the nice thing about it for me. So yes. Uh, you show uh, one of the flaws of the telescope, and you show a RA shift. And I have also had those, but in the middle of it, you get a similar system. You get a similar movement, plus a collimation and a change. So did you pick that up? Um, no. Uh, what do you mean when, when the telescope actually it's shifted? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I would have to actually. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, you have to uh, sort of refocus it, and so uh, once in a while. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And later on, when I did the BVRI um, uh, photometric calibration, it was actually getting some strange curves, like from the zenith to about five degrees. The actual curve used to go like this, and, and then go straight. And we still haven't figured out uh, it was maybe possibly something like that. But I didn't have enough time to actually analyze it any further. Yes. What are your typical measurements there is there? Um, that I didn't actually really analyze it too much because uh, uh, at the time I, I was just wanted to see if it could be done. So, uh, and like I said, I could never actually get the entire curve because of uh, where well, I was restricted the trees at home. So I could just see the dip, and that was pretty much it because you need to get that out of transit uh, band, you know, the, the actual. Uh, yeah, but you know, any one measurement plus minus. Uh, so I don't quite understand the... So the error in any one measurement of the magnitude, did you work out how much that was No, I wasn't able to do that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. More questions? Thank you very so, much, Jose. Okay,